Welcome everybody to this week's weekly webinar series. This week we're going to be discussing the top 10 pests of trees, especially those blooming trees that David Rodriguez, a horticulturalist, covered in our previous webinar. My name is Molly Keck and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Bear County. So the good news about pests on trees, for the most part, is that once your plant becomes well established in the landscape, it very rarely will experience an insect issue with it. So, um, as long as you can get that tree up and healthy and into its more adulthood or teenage years, out of that little tiny baby phase where you've just put it in the ground, the chances of you dealing with insect pests are going to be very slim. And most of the time when we deal with these insect pests, it's because our trees are not healthy for one reason or another. So if you take nothing away from this webinar, at least take this information away, that the key to reducing pest problems in your trees is to maintain healthy trees. So make sure that what they are well watered. Water is a serious problem. It either, either is in a plethora or we have no water um, in, in uh, the Texas area anywhere in Texas pretty much. So we might go with so much water that our trees can't handle it to then intense drought conditions, or we could be in droughts for many, many years. So even though it's a big tree in your landscape, you still need to make sure that you water it. We see our flowers dying off because they're not being watered well. Your trees need the water as well. So reduce drought stress, stress if you can. Also take into consideration that physical damage is one way that encourages insects to come to those plants. So if you see physical damage by animals chewing on it, maybe you hit it with the weed whacker, know that you want to try to avoid those types of things so that you don't have these pheromones that the trees give off that say, come and feed on me because I am stressed and damaged. We often see also that people put the mulch too high around the trees. This causes stress to the tree. It's not meant to be this way. So if you're going to use mulch around your tree, make sure you apply it properly. We also see that poor irrigation or drainage can also be a cause of stress in trees. And many, many times people use herbicides too close to a tree, especially weed and feeds. We forget that there's actually the herbicide in it. You can kill a huge oak tree by putting herbicides too close to that tree and the tree takes it up and it succumbs to it. So make sure that you read those labels extremely carefully and try to avoid using herbicides around the canopy of trees. So the first pest that you might see um, or that we always are concerned about um, on our trees are wood boring beetles. And there are two types of wood boring beetles. There is um, the flat headed borer, which, which is uh, the guy that you see kind of in the center picture. There are round headed borers or longhorn beetles, which is on the bottom right hand side. And those beetles uh, are named such because of the shape of their, their babies. So a flat headed borer is the top right picture of a larva and you can see it's got a big flat head to it so the holes that it's going to make are going to be more oval very exaggerated oval shapes a round-headed borer has a rounder face and so the holes that it makes are going to be more in the round form it is definitely very ovular in shape it's not a perfectly round hole but it's not that very exaggerating oval that you see on the flat-headed borers Exactly what's in your tree really is doesn't matter because the reason why they come in and what you do about it is the same no matter exactly who it is. There are some very few species that are specific to certain trees and might go after live and healthy trees. But by and large, the wood boring beetles are only attracted to stressed and dying trees. So basically, they are coming in to take advantage of a good situation. They're trying to help put that tree out of its misery. And the other thing that I would bring your attention to is the life cycle of a wood boring beetle. So when those, and while this picture is showing kind of like a cut two by four, it's the same concept on a live tree. So the beetle comes in, it mates, and it's full of eggs, and the female comes along and she either lays her eggs on a physical damage, there's a wound on the tree, or the tree is stressed out and she is now attracted to it to lay her eggs. The eggs hatch, the larva chew teeny tiny little holes, and those are not the holes that you see, and they enter the tree and they start to feed on the inside of the tree. 
The larva and pupa stage can last up to a year, and oftentimes they do last a full year. So when you see the holes after they're finished being the pupa and they're emerging as an adult to mate, lay eggs, and start the life cycle all over again, what you're seeing is evidence of an old infestation. The exit holes are the end of this life cycle. And so when we see the exit holes, we want to do something about it. But in reality, there's very little that you can do about it. So the best thing to do to try to control wood boarding beetles is maintain healthy trees, pure, pure and simple. Um, you can try tree injections, contact an arborist. Um, but really, those by and large are very futile efforts because if you can't maintain that healthy tree, you're always going to be battling beetles. So figure out the, the root of the cause, which is why the tree is not happy. Make it happy and the beetles take care of themselves. Another very common issue on trees are aphids. Aphids are kind of a cosmopolitan pest that will damage all sorts of plants. And so on trees, they do the same thing. And basically, they just kind of decrease the overall vigor of the plant. Um, what people really don't like is if the tree is rather large, the aphids are, are spitting out this honeydew. Um, it's kind of a, a waste that they produce because they're drinking all that sweet juices from the plant. And when you're standing under a tree and you're getting sticky stuff on you, that, that's aphid pee, basically. They'll also do it on your cars and uh, patio furniture and other things that maybe you don't want that sticky substance on. Aphids are very easy to control, but the key to remember is that you have to do a second treatment oftentimes because aphids will ramp up reproduction when you cut down on their population. So make sure that you treat one, two times until you get the population well under control, or sometimes you'll actually get a spike in, in population. Um, for small trees, you can try things like horticultural oils or neem or insecticidal soaps. Um, sprays that you can, you know, just kind of squirt onto the plant. But if your tree is larger, then you really want to look for things that are in those ready to use formulations, hose in sprayers so that you can spray it up into the tree and get into the canopy. You don't have to get on top of the leaves. You just have to really get under because that's where those aphids are causing damage. And then the other thing to remember is that to think about what time of year it is for these trees. If it's November, those aphids are going to die off when we hit a cold snap, and that tree will be fine come spring when it's ready to bloom out um, or produce new leaves again. So if it's kind of the end of the typical you know, yearly life cycle for a tree, I really wouldn't recommend treating for the aphids. I would treat for them to, so to allow the tree to produce a lot of blooms and make new leaves if it's springtime. Um, for very severe infestations, I suppose you could use an imidacloprid drench, but I've never seen a situation where you had such a severe infestation of aphids that is just because you have aphids and not some other underlying situation that you need to get, get under control. So I wouldn't really highly recommend using a systemic drench um, for aphids on trees. What a systemic drench is, is you it's a soil drench, the roots of the plant take it up, and so it's inside of the plant, and as the aphids feed on it, they take the pesticide in, get sick, and die from it. But foliar sprays, contact insecticides work very well against aphids. Scales are another one that, that can be wreak havoc, really, on your trees. And I know that I have a picture there of, of shrubs right there, but that's kind of the typical damage that you see. Unfortunately, you don't notice that there's a lot of damage because the inside of the tree kind of starts to die or the inside of the interior canopy dies off and then the outside leaves start to die. And then you notice the problem and maybe it's a little bit too late to really salvage that plant or there's too much damage that's happened that it's gonna be a while before that plant can really grow back. So armored scales are hard scales, and these types of scales tend to be a little more difficult to manage because they have a hard waxy layer over them. Maybe it's only the females that have that hard waxy layer over them and the males take on a different shape or morph to them, um, but they're typically very hard to use contact ins insecticides against and actually kill them. The best thing that, to do is try to figure out when they're in the crawling phase. And the crawling phase is when the eggs have hatched and they're crawling to a new place to, to live. You will see them kind of at the base of the tree or at the maybe at the base of a limb, and then that spreads and spreads and spreads. The reason why it's continuing to spread is because the crawlers are getting out of the dense populated areas with the parents. So put some sticky tape, you know, flipped upside down, wrap it around uh, one of the limbs very close to where the infestation is, and when you notice that there's more and more of them on it, then you know that's a really good time to actually treat. 
because they're active, they're exposed, it's easy to kill them, and you kind of kill get that second generation. Mealybugs are um, kind of similar to scales, but generally they're softer and they have more of a cottony look to them. Um, they might also exude kind of a cottony substance that 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 coats their body and kind of protects them. Um, they are a little bit easier to control using contact insecticides because they're a little bit softer body, they're not as protected as well. In general, for control of scales and mealybugs, you do wanna control them because their populations can rise really, really quickly, but they'll reduce the plant vigor, they'll stunt the growth, they'll produce honeydew, and so you get this sooty mold that forms, black mold forming on the plants. Um, they just also can, overall, they can kill the plant if you're not taking care of it. They really are a problem on, on fruits, citrus, and woody ornamentals. So really all encompassing for most trees, right? We do know that for scale problems, if you do not irrigate properly, then you can elicit huge scale infestations. The plant becomes stressed because it either has too much or not enough water. Generally, it's not enough water. And then the scales take over because the plant can't combat um, they no longer have kind of the self, um, the self regulating mechanisms to keep the scales off of them or to hurt the scales as they feed on them. So, uh, as far as foliar sprays go, active ingredients could include dinotefuran, horticultural oils, imidacloprid, neem, insecticidal soaps, but always retreat within 10 to 14 days or when you, with your sticky card, notice the crawlers are starting to move. Systemics are ideal if you have persistent infestations, um, and that would be usually for armored scales, but systemic, again, is something that you drench the soil with around the base of the tree. It the roots take it up, and um, as the plant feeds on it, it gets sick and it dies. Imidacloprid and dinotefuran are probably your two um, uh, best options that you'll find at your local nursery or at the box stores, anywhere where pesticides are sold. Now, people are always really concerned about carpenter ants. And um, as you can kind of see from this picture, what I'm trying to illustrate here is carpenter ants inside of a dead uh, knot hole kind of in a tree. What I would love for everybody to remember and take from this webinar is that carpenter ants only nest in dead wood. They also do not feed on the wood. And I will re-emphasize that it's only in dead wood. Many of our larger trees, it is very common for it to have a hollow center or the center of the tree is dead wood without it actually being a bad thing for that tree. So if you have carpenter ants in a tree trunk, they are not going after the live wood of the tree. They are completely uninterested in it. They generally like dead wood that is, is softer because it has some fungal matter in it. Maybe it had um, some sort of a conducive condition, like uh, too much moisture in that wood, and so it's easy for them to feed on. But live wood, they absolutely will not nest in. They don't feed on it, and they won't chew on it. One, while I would say it is not a concern if you have carpenter ants, you see carpenter ants on a tree, at all, um, unless there's a big dead branch that you maybe need to cut down because it might hit your, your house. Um, what I would say is that those carpenter ants can make satellite mounds. And so sometimes they'll get into our door frames and our window sills and other places where maybe we had some wood rot or some water damage um, and they are a nuisance inside the house. They're not a structural pest, really considered a structural pest here in Texas, but they are in other parts of the world. And if you do feel the need to control them, I would contact your local pest control company where they can actually treat the, the, the main mound outside or at least try to find it. But if you want to kind of put a Band-Aid on the problem, there are some baits and you want to make sure that you use baits that are for carpenter ants. So generally they are like a shrimp based or a shellfish based bait, advanced carpenter ant bait, very stinky so you don't want to leave it in the back of your car. You put those in tiny little piles because they tend to choose to prefer to choose from piles as opposed to broadcast. Or you can try to use gel baits. Those are great if you have cracking crevices. Maybe they're up in the eaves of your um, of your home. Um, or maybe you know that they're inside the house somewhere. And so you can use a cracking crevice in a little spot where you notice they're coming in and out of a windowsill. So those are, that's that was what I would use for that. I wouldn't just squirt it around a tree and hope that they come after it. But also reduce the conducive conditions. Are they in that windowsill because you had water damage to that wood? Does it need to be replaced? Are they around the eaves because you had a leak somewhere? Um, is your sprinkler constantly hitting that side of the house and it's hitting the door and so that door frame starting to rot away? Figure out why they're there to begin with. Uh, reduce that. 
use the baits, but if you don't reduce the conducive condition, then they're likely to keep coming back. We know that caterpillars can be a problem for pretty much any type of, of plant. There are a number of caterpillars that will skeletonize and eat the leaves off of a number of blooming plants, such as red buds. Um, if you do notice that you have a caterpillar issue and you think that they're really defoliating your plant, then BT and Spinosad are two really good options. But there are other options out there that you can find in ready to use, um, you know, hook up to the hose and, and spray the tree down. That's usually going to get you the best coverage, especially for a larger tree. Systemics are rarely a good option. I really don't recommend them for caterpillar control unless the issue is very persistent because you often have to use systemics early on for it to actually affect the caterpillar. So unless you have a timeline that you know happens every year, there's really no point in using a systemic against caterpillars. Also, caterpillar life cycle is relatively short, so by the time they all pupate and take off, the damage has been done and there's not much you can do about it as far as the systemic goes to try to control that. Foliar sprays, you might be able to kill a caterpillar or two and make yourself feel good about it. Other than just skeletonizing the trees, there's a couple other ways that caterpillars can be damaging. They um, usually form some sort of webbing in some way, um, and generally they're doing this in oak trees, uh, elm trees, pecan trees, large trees, not necessarily your smaller ornamental and blooming trees, but they can certainly move into those trees if they if you have a big pecan tree, let's say, at your house. So the oak leaf roller is the one on the far left-hand side, and there are some years when these are just all over the place. It's a small little caterpillar that when it's uh, irritated and it falls out of the tree, it spins the silk to try to pull itself back up into the tree. And on a windy day, if you have hundreds of these caterpillars, thousands in the tree, then it's like you have streamers coming out of the trees all the time. Um, the middle picture is the fall webworm. They make webbing around a clump of leaves, feed inside of it, and then move on to the next thing. And that type of plant, that type of caterpillar will get into a number of other um, ornamental trees, more so than the oak leaf roller will. The tent caterpillar usually is in more woody, um, uh, larger trees, but what they will do is build a nest kind of in the, in the um, crotch of the tree, leave to go feed, and then come back into the nest. For all of these guys, the key is to reduce the nest material if at all possible, at least for the fall webworm and for the tent caterpillar, especially for the fall webworm because they're in there, and if you can't break that open in some way, then the pesticide's never going to penetrate. However, while they might defoliate the tree, they will not likely kill the tree. There's also no law in the state of Texas that says that if your neighbor has fall webworms in their trees, that they have to do something about it to protect your trees. Um, just keep your trees happy and healthy, and likely these guys aren't going to cause any major concern for you. Now on to some more specific pests for specific trees. So if you have mountain laurels, which is a beautiful tree that we love to have in our landscapes, a lovely evergreen and that makes that fabulous uh, flower in, in March and April that smells very fragrant, like a grape Kool-Aid to most people, you might notice some of those red mountain laurel myrids on your plant. Myridae is a family for a group of plant feeding insects and this mountain laurel myrid is specific to mountain laurels. Um, it is unique because it's able to overcome some of the toxicity that mountain laurels have. Mountain laurels generally have very few insects that will feed on them because they are toxic, but this guy's able to do it. And you can kind of see those mouth parts they have right there that will pierce into the plant tissue and then maybe even into the seed pod. And so if you've ever noticed kind of a, a wilted or deformed look to the new growth as it comes out on the leaves, that's probably caused by these guys. Very little concern, rarely is it over, hurt the overall health of the tree. Um, it's just kind of something that is there. It's the same, I always say, as if you're worried about these, you might as well worry about birds in the sky. There's not much that you could really do to control them and there's really no need to try to control them. The genistic caterpillar sometimes does need to be controlled, especially when it is a brand new plant that you've put in the ground. It's very small and you really want it to grow. Genistic caterpillar is a, a kind of a greenish yellow caterpillar that feeds on the new growth of the leaves and will feed, um, if will probably feed longer on in the year as long as you have some tender growth there, but they're more common when that new growth comes out. They will end up rolling the leaves and pupating in there with some webbing, and then what emerges is just kind of a boring, um, 
brown moth. So it's not a very impressive uh, butterfly or moth that you would be killing. If the plant is well established, I say leave them alone unless they're just absolutely all over the place. But if it's a smaller plant, that's when I am more likely to tell somebody to try to control these guys because they are, um, um, you just don't want the plant to stay small. You don't want to dwarf the growth. You want it to be allowed to grow. So BT, spinosad, permethrin, that's misspelled right there, lambda cyhalothrin, any of those things that are in that ready to use hosen formulation is a good option. Now, crepe myrtle, myrtle bark scale is a relatively new scale. It's an invasive scale from Asia, um, and it overall does not hurt the tree. It has not been known to hurt crepe myrtles, but what it does do aesthetically, it leaves an ugly look to the tree. I mean, you can see all the scales all over the, the bark, and it's just amazing to me that the, the, there's that many scales, but the tree is still fine. The other thing they'll do is they cause this sooty mold, and so the bark looks black. Um, like you can see in that far left-hand picture, it looks dirty. And so just aesthetically, it's ugly, and um, you might want to try to control it on your crepe myrtles. We know that the populations peak around mid-April through May, but depending on where you are in the state, you can determine that yourself by using these stickies, uh, you know, sticky tape or sticky traps and wrapping the bark with it. And when you see crawlers get stuck to it and you then you start to see more and more and more, that's when you know the populations are peaking in your area. These are the counties within Texas that we know that we have them, but certainly we probably have them in other counties. Um, it's probably getting spread through um, um, you know, nursery stock, uh, could be just natural spread, a uh, number of different ways, but probably it's in more places than this because you know that crepe myrtles are definitely a staple in most landscapes. They're a beautiful blooming tree. Um, if you're trying to control these guys, bark sprays, spraying the bark when the populations are really high can be effective. And that is kind of when you start noticing that they look pretty bad, but you always want to retreat a second time. In recent research that was done through Texas A&M AgriLife in the Overton um, uh, location, he used bifenthrin, pyroproxifen, buprofazine, and dinotefuran. What you'll get your hands on most likely is bifenthrin products, and thankfully that is what he found that was the most effective. So if you can find bifenthrin type products meant for trees, that's that that seemed to have the most knockdown than the other products did. He did not rule out using those other products though, if that's what you happen to be able to find. Also, if you can treat early when populations are low, and this is usually mid to the end of March. Now Overton, he, he applied and did his, his research in Overton and in Dallas, I believe. So that's a little bit warmer than maybe if you're in the San Antonio area or further south. So that's why using those sticky cards to determine when your populations are high is really important, or when the populations are not really high is really important. So mid to end of March, use a systemic, try to knock them down before they're allowed to reproduce. And dinotefuran and imidacloprid are those two options for you. Also, mid to end of March is not when the plant is blooming. So if you are highly concerned about your pollinators, then um, if you're using an over-the-counter type product from you know, a box store or a nursery, it's not going to be in the plant uh, into the summertime most likely where it could potentially damage your, your honeybees. Also remember that crepe myrtles produce no nectar. They only produce pollen, so the insects are going after it for nectar. So if you have zero honeybees in your area, which would be very weird, um, you don't have to worry about it because your butterflies are not going to be attracted to the uh, crepe myrtles because they cannot feed on anything but nectar. Also, I wanted to point out that there are a number of other hosts. Most recently, we discovered that they will utilize American beautyberry bush as a host, but also they have the potential to utilize fig and apple and pomegranate hackberry soybean. So they can also be uh, harmful in, in agricultural systems and any of the berries, dewberries, blackberries, raspberries, things like that. So they have a pretty broad host range, which is why we would, we would want to really control them, even if they're not doing damage on crepe myrtles, because we don't want them to spread to other populations and cause a major problem there. I've got a bonus pest for you for um, um, tree pests, and this is the emerald ash borer. I know that emerald, that ash is not 
really considered to be an ornamental blooming tree. But the emerald ash borer is a fairly recent, very invasive and highly destructed type of a borer. Um, I said there are always exceptions to the rules, right? Where you might have a borer that is going after a specific tree. And this is the case for these guys. So right now in Texas, we only really have them in a handful of counties. In um, the summer of 2016, they were just discovered in Harrison County, which is in very far northeast uh, Texas. And then in December, we discovered them in Tarrant County. So it took quite a jump. And we believe it took that jump because we moved it in firewood. So one of the key things that we tell people is if you're going to do camping, don't bring firewood from other places. Utilize the firewood that is there and don't move it to other spots. That's the most likelihood that most likely way that we'll get firewood moved from spot to spot. We also know it's now in Marion and Cass counties, which are very close to Harrison County. So that's probably um, it's it's just locally spreading that way. But we're going to start seeing it jump from spot to spot if we continue to move product that they're nesting in. Now, while we don't have a number, a huge number of native ashes in Texas, we do have a handful of them depending on where you live in the state. But what we do have is a number of non-native ash that we have just planted in our landscape, a lot of those. And so those trees certainly will succumb to this emerald ash borer. The signs and symptoms of emerald ash borer, initially, you will start to see the canopy die back. Um, so you'll get the, the top third until the, the entire tree becomes bare. Then um, epicormic shoots will start to pop out from the base of the tree, and the, that is the tree putting its last-ditch effort into trying to save itself. What, while it has Once it has started with those epicormic shoots, you usually can't really do anything about it. The telltale sign is that they produce these D-shaped exit holes. The bark will also start to split and you can see that serpentine pattern of the um, borers as they're feeding underneath the bark. But those D-shaped um, exit holes are very, very characteristic of just the emerald ash borer. And the D can be in any orientation. It does not have to be up, down, backwards, or right side up. Um, also, you might see some increased woodpecker activity as the woodpeckers are going after the exposed borers as the bark starts to split up. So right now what we're really trying to do is just get people to be aware of this um, pest and so we can determine if they're found in other places or not. There are some recommendations for managing them, but unless you actually have them, there's not really preemptive things that you would really concern yourself with at this time. The USDA um, has and has a great website with some good information about management for them. But unfortunately, once they get into a tree, it's pretty much the demise of the tree. So what we want to do is monitor and determine what counties they're found in. So if you're within a radius of where they were spotted, you know that you do want to treat your tree in case they come in. And really all you're treating are your ash trees. So right now, for those of you guys in the South Central San Antonio area, what you're looking for is just to identify them when they get here first. Um, and you can send that information to your local county extension office, or you can just Google where you send things. It's usually USDA APHIS who takes care of um, inf uh, invasive species. Um, but there are agencies out there that will uh, identify it properly and, and, and put out the proper recommendations to local uh, communities. So I also just wanted to discuss some damage that you might see on your trees that isn't necessarily an insect that does it. In this case, if you don't know what this is, this is most likely damage from lightning strike. So sometimes that can look a little bit like woodpecker damage or um, another insect that's causing it when in reality it was just an act of nature. This is typical woodpecker damage. It's very funny that woodpeckers can make kind of a very large hole that's not very deep or they can make a series of a number of holes. And the reason why I can immediately tell that this is woodpecker damage and not a borer exiting is because borer exit holes are random. They're all over the place. Woodpecker damage it will be straight longitudinal up and down as they're just moving down the, the bark or across in straight lines. When it's more patterned like this, it's definitely woodpeckers and not any kind of a borer. 
Galls are another thing that people get very concerned about. But in reality, a gall is a formation that the tree makes, that the plant makes itself to protect itself from an insect that's feeding on it or laying its eggs in it. Totally harmless, just very weird to look at. And when an insect lays its eggs in the plant tissue, it forms that gall, usually around the egg. And sometimes galls are also formed when insects feed on the plant tissue. And although they can be fuzzy or gigantic, it's, it's amazing and a great, a great feat of Mother Nature that she's, these plants are able to make this themselves. It's made completely out of cellulose material, even though it looks nothing at all like any part of the plant. Porcupines also cause quite a bit of damage. They say that in San Antonio, you mainly see porcupines outside of 1604, um, but they certainly can be inside 1604 as well. And if you live in a more rural area outside of 1604, I think you would be amazed at how many porcupines are actually around. Young porcupines will scrape trees. Um, if you're planting brand new trees and you are in a rural area or you know that you have porcupines, you probably want to put some sort of fencing around those trees because they'll scrape, scrape, scrape on the bark, cause too much stress to the tree, and eventually kill it if you're not watering it well and taking care of it otherwise. Porcupines can also climb trees. Um, they are rodents, so they're going to always be gnawing on something. Um, so if you, if you uh, notice this kind of damage on your bark, you've definitely got porcupines. And then sometimes there's damage that we have no idea is what's causing it. Um, sometimes cicadas will cause damage to trees. This was um, a resident that sent in some pictures. I think it was in his landscape somewhere, but this damage was on a handful, one or two trees, I believe, and nobody could figure it out. The emails were going around and around to arborists and foresters and entomologists, what could be causing this damage? And I think the consensus at the end of the day was that it's probably squirrel damage, but there was a number of other guesses, like it could be cicadas that are causing it. It could just be a weird growth of the tree. Um, ultimately, it didn't seem to harm the tree. The tree was fine, um, but it was you know, sometimes you'll see damage on trees and it's a mystery and it will just always remain a mystery. Thank you for joining us for this week's weekly webinar series. My name is Molly Keck and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. To watch any of our other webinars, make sure you check them out on this YouTube channel, My Extension 210.